Hello, I'm Tim Henderson with Aero Accessories. We manufacture diaphragm fuel pumps approved for use on a wide range of type certificated general aviation aircraft. Let's see how they work and how they interface with the fuel system and a few other interesting things about them. Diaphragm fuel pumps and rotary pumps are very different. Rotary pumps produce excess flow that splits between the engine and a bypass that sends the excess flow back through the pump. A pressure regulator maintains a steady outlet pressure even when the flow to the engine varies. This rotary pump is delivering 30 gallons per hour total, 28 to the engine, and bypassing two. It's maintaining 25 PSI as it does so. Only if the total demand exceeds the pump's total capacity will the pressure fall. At that point, the regulator goes closed. It can't adjust any further, so the pressure falls. All other regulators shown in this schematic representation of a fixed displacement pump appears as a separate unit. It's normally built right into the body of the pump. Whether the pump is electrically driven like this rotary boost pump or engine driven like this RG9080 type. Regardless of where the regulator is mounted, it's the regulator that provides for fixed displacement pumps to maintain a steady pressure when flow to the engine varies. Here's a typical diaphragm pump. Unlike the fixed displacement pump, just described, it's a variable displacement pump. It doesn't have a pressure regulator, so its output pressure will vary when flow to the engine varies. Here's an animation of a simple diaphragm pump. The lever lifts the diaphragm up, compressing the mainspring. The mainspring then pushes the diaphragm down, forcing fuel out. This spring keeps slack out of the drivetrain. The diaphragm draws fuel in, like you draw air into your lungs when you breathe in. Then it pushes the fuel out when it goes back down. The fuel servo provides the downstream restriction necessary to build pressure at the pump. The pump's outlet and the servo's inlet see the same pressure. Differential pressure created by the diaphragm's movement operates the valves. Unlike fixed displacement pumps, the diaphragm pump's pressure varies with flow. And the pressure varies inversely to the flow. Here's high flow and low pressure, medium flow and medium pressure, and low flow and high pressure. As the flow goes up, the pressure goes down. And as the flow goes down, the pressure goes up. Maximum pressure is achieved at zero flow. The pump doesn't determine how much fuel goes to the engine. That's the fuel injection servo's job. If 28 gallons an hour is needed, or zero, that's what the pump delivers. Basically, the pump is a slave to the servo. Loss motion linkage lets the pump stroke vary so that its output equals the servo's demand. Here, the servo is demanding no fuel. The diaphragm is up and supported on a charge of trapped fuel in the pumping chamber. While the lever is still cycling, the diaphragm isn't moving. However, when fuel does flow and leaves the pump chamber, the diaphragm does descend. Then each time the lever cycles, it lifts the diaphragm, taking in more fuel and recompressing the spring. There's only a spring's worth of power to pump the fuel. The engine just recocks the spring. In a sense, the pump is a spring-driven pump, not an engine-driven pump. The spring can make high pressure or high flow, or some of both, but the more of one, the less of the other. 
actual diaphragm movement is very small. The animations exaggerate it for clarity. At idle, for example, actual diaphragm movement is just a few thousandths of an inch. At full throttle, it's a little more. It's still exaggerated here, so you can see it. At 2400 RPM, a pump cycles 20 times per second. It doesn't take much diaphragm movement to pump the amount of fuel needed in that short space of time. An engine using 28 gallons an hour uses about 38 ten thousandths of a gallon per pump stroke. That's a volume of fuel about equal to this cube. At idle, the volume of fuel per stroke may be less than that of a grain of salt. This red line represents performance for an overhauled pump and this blue one for a new one. Their performance is essentially the same. The difference is just the normal production variation between individual pumps. At zero flow, this overhauled pump reached 27 PSI max. With flow at five gallons, the pressure drops to about 25 PSI. And at 10 gallons to below 25 PSI, the pressure will keep falling as flow increases. Maximum pressure is checked at zero flow in 1800 cycles. If the maximum pressure at zero flow is from 24 to 30 PSI, the spring is good and internal leakage is satisfactory. One flow check occurs at 2 PSI in 1800 cycles. 45 gallons an hour is the acceptable minimum flow at these settings. As back pressure increases, flow decreases. Here's the result of applying back pressure at 5, 10, and 15 PSI. This pump's flow dropped by about 2, 16, and 30 gallons, respectively. It's the servo, not the pump, that establishes pump pressure. Pump pressure, also called servo inlet pressure or unmetered pressure, on an engine using about 28 gallons an hour might typically be about 20 to 23 PSI. The servo's regulator reduces the pump pressure to metered pressure. That's the pressure that goes to the cylinder nozzles and determines the correct fuel-air ratio for the engine. Metered pressure is normally well below unmetered or pump pressure. As long as pump pressure exceeds metered pressure, full flow is available to the nozzles. The servo compensates for the normal variations in pump pressure and holds metered pressure relatively steady so that the engine gets the proper amount of fuel. A 200 horsepower engine using 18 gallons per hour might have a metered pressure of about 10 to 12 PSI. As long as the pump pressure is higher than metered pressure, fuel flow is okay. However, if pump pressure falls below metered pressure, the servo regulator goes full open and effectively becomes a fixed orifice. Then, if pressure falls even further, so does nozzle pressure and fuel flow. Here's a representative 200 horsepower fuel curve. Unmetered pressure, that is pump pressure, was intentionally reduced from 20 PSI in increments to show what happens to metered pressure and fuel delivery as pressure falls. Fuel flow, shown in percent, stayed within 3% of maximum until pump pressure fell below 10 PSI. Above 14 PSI pressure, there was almost no discernible change. Flow remained within 2% of the original. The names 25 pound and 5 pound pump are just names for the common high and low pressure pumps normally used on fuel injected and carbureted engines, respectively. The flow capacity of the high pressure pump is sufficient to run both engines simultaneously on a Piper Aztec when cross feeding. At high power, that's about 50 gallons per hour. This pump's pressure at 53 gallons an hour is about 18 PSI. That's well above the typical meter pressure for an I0540. So it can run two of these engines simultaneously with no problem. A little I0360 engine sipping 22 gallons an hour is just no problem for a high pressure fuel pump. This pump's dual diaphragms provide safety and pumping redundancy. The upper diaphragm keeps fuel out of the engine crankcase if the fuel diaphragm leaks, thus preventing oil dilution or a crankcase explosion or a fire. Fuel leaking through the lower diaphragm 
accumulates in the chamber between the two diaphragms as shown here. Then it leaks out the drain fitting, which is fitted with a tiny orifice, and then it goes overboard. The leakage makes a blue streak on the aircraft's belly, alerting the pilot to the problem. Checking for this should be part of a good pre-flight inspection. If the fuel diaphragm bursts, the chamber between the diaphragms will fill solid with fuel, and the pump will keep right on pumping. The tiny orifice in the drain ring restricts external leakage and creates pressure in the chamber between the diaphragm. That allows a solid hydraulic column to form that keeps the pumps working, even with a burst fuel diaphragm. However, if the leakage from the drain ring is not piped overboard, and that gasoline is sprayed onto a hot exhaust pipe or turbocharger, it could cause big problems. Always pipe the drain ring overboard and never plug the port. Air inlet leaks are the cause of most pump performance problems, and it only takes a small one to defeat the pump. A missing or chipped O-ring, a cracked inlet boss, or an air leak at a fitting is all it takes to stop the pump working. Air, sucked into the pump's chamber, fills the pumping chamber, displaces the gasoline, and stops the fuel flow. Some air leaks may cause fuel starvation soon after the boost pump is turned off, whether on the ground or in the air. Smaller air leaks can cause a loss of pressure and fuel starvation some seconds or minutes after the boost pump is turned off. Sometimes this happens on takeoff or during the climb. Usually, turning the boost pump back on gets the fuel flowing again, but turn off the boost pump and soon the engine may quit again. After air leaks, levers broken during installation cause the most problems. This lever is under the push rod, where it's supposed to be, while this lever is improperly installed beside the push rod, not under it where it's supposed to be. When the mounting bolts are tightened, the side load imposed will break the lever. This broken and bent lever shows that it was installed beside the push rod, not under it. And this signature mark on the lever further confirms it. Another cause of problems is blocked or partially blocked fuel systems. Debris can block tank outlets, causing engine stoppage. After the engine stops and there's no fuel flowing, the debris may float away from the tank screens, temporarily clearing them. Then the engine may start again and the cycle of startup, clog the screens, fuel starvation, and engine stoppage may be repeated. If not found and corrected, an in-flight power failure and a post-flight crash may occur. The pump's pulsator diaphragm helps to smooth out fuel pressure pulses. Each diaphragm downstroke creates a pressure spike that stretches the pulsator diaphragm a little, storing a little energy. That energy is released on the pump's upstroke. It smooths out the pressure spikes and helps reduce the workload on the servo regulator. Don't take these pumps apart in the field if you intend to use them again. It takes special equipment to properly reassemble them. Pumps should be overhauled or replaced at intervals specified in the aircraft manufacturer's instructions for continued airworthiness or in the absence of such instruction at engine TBO or after 10 calendar years, whichever comes first. These pumps contain rubber parts, and time and heat and repeated flexing takes a toll on them. Nothing can be expected to last forever, so periodic overhaul is important. That's how diaphragm pumps work. They are highly reliable, inexpensive, and simple. When installed properly, these pumps are likely to run to TBO without problems. If you have questions or need a new or overhauled pump or other Tempest part, Give us a call. We appreciate your business. Thank you.